Chapter Twenty Six of International Short Stories, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gilles Leblanc. International Short Stories, Volume Two, by William Patton. Chapter Twenty Six. Gilray's Flower Pot by J. M. Barry. I charge Gilray's unreasonableness to his ignoble passion for cigarettes, and the story of his flower pot has therefore an obvious moral. The want of dignity he displayed about that flower pot on his return to London would have made any one sorry for him. I had my own work to look after, and really could not be tending his chrysanthemum all day. After he came back, however, there was no reasoning with him, and I admit that I never did water his plant, though always intending to do so. The great mistake was in not leaving the flower-pot in charge of William John. No doubt I readily promised to attend to it, but Gilray deceived me by speaking as if the watering of a plant was the merest pastime. He had to leave London for a short provincial tour, and, as I see now, took advantage of my good nature. As Gilray had owned his flower-pot for several months, during which time, I take him at his word, he had watered it daily, he must have known he was misleading me. He said that you got into the way of watering a flower-pot regularly just as you wind up your watch. That certainly is not the case. I always wind up my watch, and I never watered the flower-pot. Of course, if I had been living in Gilray's rooms with the thing always before my eyes, I might have done so. I proposed to take it into my chambers at the time, but he would not hear of that. Why? How Gilray came by this chrysanthemum I do not inquire, but whether in the circumstances he should not have made a clean breast of it to me is another matter. Undoubtedly it was an unusual thing to put a man to the trouble of watering a chrysanthemum daily without giving him its history. My own belief has always been that he got it in exchange for a pair of boots and his old dressing gown. He hints that it was not a present but as one who knows him well i may say that he is the last person a lady would be likely to give a chrysanthemum to besides if he was so proud of the plant he should have stayed at home and watered it himself he says that i never meant to water it which is not only a mistake but unkind my plan was to run downstairs immediately after dinner every evening and give it a thorough watering one thing or another however came in the way I often remembered about the chrysanthemum while I was in the office, but even Gilray could hardly have expected me to ask leave of absence merely to run home and water his plant. You must draw the line somewhere, even in a government office. When I reached home I was tired, inclined to take things easily, and not at all in a proper condition for watering flower-pots. Then Arcadians would drop in. I put it to any sensible man or woman could i have been expected to give up my friends for the sake of a chrysanthemum again it was my custom of an evening if not disturbed to retire with my pipe into my cane chair and there pass the hours communing with great minds or when the mood was on me trifling with a novel often when i was in the middle of a chapter gilray's flower-pot stood up before my eyes crying for water he does not believe this but it is the solemn truth at those moments it was touch and go, whether I watered his chrysanthemum or not. Where I lost myself was in not hurrying to his rooms at once with a tumbler. I said to myself that I would go when I had finished my pipe, but by that time the flower-pot has escaped my memory. This may have been weakness. All I know is that I should have saved myself much annoyance if I had risen and watered the chrysanthemum there and then. But would it not have been rather hard on me to have had to forsake my books for the sake of Gilray's flowers and flower-pots and plants and things? What right has a man to go and make a garden of his chambers? All the three weeks he was away, Gilray kept pestering me with letters about his chrysanthemum. He seemed to have no faith in me, a detestable thing in a man who calls himself your friend. I had promised to water his flower-pot and between friends a promise is surely sufficient. It is not so, however, when Gilray is one of them. I soon hated the sight of my name in his handwriting. 
It was not as if he had said outright that he wrote entirely to know whether I was watering his plant. His references to it were introduced with all the appearance of afterthoughts. Often they took the form of postscripts. By the way, are you watering my chrysanthemum? Or, the chrysanthemum ought to be a beauty by this time. Or, you must be quite an adept now at watering plants. Gilray declares now that, in answer to one of these ingenious epistles, I wrote to him saying that I had just been watering his chrysanthemum. My belief is that I did no such thing, or, if I did, I meant to water it as soon as I had finished my letter. He has never been able to bring this home to me, he says, because he burned my correspondence. As if a businessman would destroy such a letter. It was yet more annoying when Gilray took to postcards. To hear the postman's knock and then discover, when you are expecting an important communication, that it is only a postcard about a flower pot, that is really too bad. And then I consider that some of the postcards bordered upon insult. One of them said, What about chrysanthemum? Reply at once. This was just like Gilray's overbearing way. But I answered politely, and so far as I knew, truthfully. Chrysanthemum, all right. Knowing that there was no explaining things to Gilray, I redoubled my exertions to water his flower pot as the day for his return drew near. Once, indeed, when I rang for water, I could not for the life of me remember what I wanted it for when it was brought. Had I had any forethought, I should have left the tumbler stand just as it was to show it to Gilray on his return. But, unfortunately, William John had misunderstood what I wanted the water for, and put a decanter down beside it. Another time I was actually on the stair, rushing to Gilray's door, when I met the housekeeper, and, stopping to talk to her, lost my opportunity again. To show how honestly anxious I was to fulfill my promise, I need only add that I was several times awakened in the watches of the night by a haunting consciousness that I had forgotten to water Gilray's flower-pot. On these occasions I spared no trouble to remember again in the morning. I reached out of bed to a chair and turned it upside down, so that the sight of it when I rose might remind me that I had something to do. With the same object I crossed the tongs and poker on the floor. Gilray maintains that instead of playing fool's tricks like these, fool's tricks, I should have got up and gone at once to his rooms with my water bottle. What? And disturbed my neighbors? Besides, could I reasonably be expected to risk catching my death of cold for the sake of a wretched chrysanthemum? One reads of men doing such things for young ladies who seek lilies in dangerous ponds or edelweiss on overhanging cliffs. But Gilray was not my sweetheart, nor, I feel certain, any other person's. I come now to the day prior to Gilray's return. I had just reached the office when I remembered about the chrysanthemum. It was my last chance. If I watered it once, I should be in a position to state that, whatever condition it might be in, I had certainly been watering it. I jumped into a hansom, told the cabby to drive to the inn, and twenty minutes afterward had one hand on Gilray's door, while the other held the largest water can in the house. Opening the door, I rushed in. The can nearly fell from my hand. There was no flower pot. I rang the bell. Mr. Gilray's chrysanthemum, I cried. What do you think William John said? He coldly told me that the plant was dead and had been flung out days ago. I went to the theater that night to keep myself from thinking. All next day I contrived to remain out of Gilray's sight. When we met he was stiff and polite. He did not say a word about the chrysanthemum for a week. And then it all came out with a rush. I let him talk. With the servants flinging out the flower-pots faster than I could water them, what more could I have done? A coolness between us was inevitable. This I regretted, but my mind was made up on one point. I would never do Gilray a favor again. End of chapter 26